Deixem-me começar com duas questões organizativas em português, antes de passar para o inglês, que será a língua da conferência. Eu eh, lembro que a maneira de obter um certificado de presença eh, nesta conferência, que eu depois assino, portanto, quem tiver eh, interesse, necessidade no tal certificado, que não se esqueça de eh, pedir assinar pela sua parte, para se preencher para eu poder assinar. E a outra, eh, a outra questão que eu ia ter referido em português antes de começarmos é que gostaríamos naturalmente que Haja, haja um debate tão participado quanto possível e, obviamente, quem quisesse fazer perguntas em português ou em francês, ou em alemão, mas enfim, isso é muito provável, que não existe. A conferência vai ser em inglês, vamos conversar e discutir em inglês, mas não deve haver nenhum obstáculo a intervenções em português que serão uh, incorporadas na discussão. And so I will now open the session more formally in, in English. I'm extremely happy to welcome Alphonse Boa here and to have the opportunity to hear him more, uh, moreover on topics that are of uh, extremely uh, of high interest relevance to us at this very moment for institutional reasons. Uh, I uh, would like to shortly introduce Alphonse Bora. Uh, we know each other since now several years, um, basically because we are both sociologists of the This is a this is a rather integrated community uh, where a personal relationship is quite uh, intense, as a matter of fact, and uh, our friendship has a lot to do with the fact that we are active in this, uh, in this beautiful, uh, as a matter of fact, beautiful uh, epistemic community, sociology of law. Uh, Arthur Spohr is trained as a lawyer and as sociologist. He uh, works now, uh, he uh, worked uh, rather, rather intensively on uh, authors that you know certainly like uh, Habermas and Luhmann, and actually our common interest for these authors is one more reason of our uh, extremely fruitful contacts uh, since years now. I, I circulate his two doctoral dissertations, uh, they have to hand in, in Germany. Uh, this gives to those who have some notions of German uh, an idea of his work, and two more recent uh, books that do connect somehow with uh, the topics he will tackle now. Uh, he works at the University of Bielefeld and uh, uh, it's probably important uh, for us to know that he now is responsible for um, uh, an area on uh, law and society where um, bachelor, master and doctoral courses uh, are organized in this field of law and society and possibly to uh, complete the picture uh, it is important to know also especially when it comes to topics such as regulation and governance Alphonse Bora tackles these issues not only um, with, the, um, with the material of, uh, of research and study, academic study of these, uh, these issues, but also on the basis of a more practical uh, experience uh, and mainly uh, his participation in the German ethic art, uh, a body that uh, uh, gives uh, advices, uh, opinions to the parliament and to the government and that uh, takes over a, a broader mission of reflection on ethical issues and, uh, uh, and giving more uh, dynamics to the public debate on these issues in Germany. So I think this is the background that I thought would be useful for you to have to hear the 
conference of Athens Boa, we have the floor. It would be really great to hear you now. Thank you, thank you, Pierre, for your kind <coughs> invitation and uh, your introductory words, your kind uh, words. Thank you also, ladies and gentlemen, for coming and for being interested in what I suggest today. Um, my, my subject today is regulation, as indicated in the title of my talk, Rethinking Regulation of Government. This is all about a bit provocative, but uh, I hope it will, will trigger some discussions among us. With the term regulation, I'm automatically concerned with contemporary forms of sovereignty and ruling mostly connected with the label of governance in scholarly debates. This is state of the art. My general aim is to scrutinize this term, governance, and to pledge for a stronger emphasis on the nucleus of sovereignty and ruling, which can be seen in the exercise of power oriented towards the production of public good. And against this background, the success, or success story of governance creates some need of explanation for sociological theory and also of the recollection of regulation in the theory of law, politics and society. I will proceed in four steps. This is the only slide I brought. There is nothing more to see, just in order to guide you through the talk. And uh, I hope it is so well structured that, that you will be easily able to follow. Introductory remarks, neoliberalism and civil society, the rhetoric of governance. Let me start my considerations with an observation so trivial that it often seems to be overlooked. Recalling the last decades, we see that the worldwide triumph of neoliberal policies and the widespread deregulation of nearly all sectors of society go hand in hand with the rise of civil society. A global expansion of different forms of citizen engagement, the participation of civil society actors in various fields of decision making, direct democratic procedures, civic involvement, etc. is obvious and not deniable. The emergence of a very broad variety of new and hybrid forms of collective formation of will and decision making characterizes temporary society on all levels, local, national, regional and supranational. A rather common view interprets the rise of a broad participation of civil society as caused by the success of neoliberalism and deregulation as a defensive move, in other words. Many politically programmatic texts can be read in this way. Think, for instance, of well, European white papers and similar, similar examples. Social sciences, however, are well advised not to take this interpretation for granted. We rather read it as an interpretive pattern operating in the political field. And we treat the causal relation between neoliberal liberal and civic participation as an open question. Open question. Oh, yes. What is causal? Against this background, of course, generally three hypotheses are possible. Firstly, the causal relation already mentioned, claiming that an exuberant economization of society causes civic engagement. Secondly, the reverse relation is also possible, claiming that cultural and political change towards a more open society also triggered economization well, a hypothesis that is certainly very difficult to argue for with respect to empirical evidence and that I will not add, therefore. Thirdly, a co-evolutionary hypothesis claiming a common trait in both phenomena producing a specific mode of sovereignty and ruling under which both neoliberal policies and civic participation emerge coincidentally and primordially into a symbiotic partnership. 
The mode of sovereignty I'm talking about is well known under the name of governance. And this specific type of rule, I will argue, both forms peacefully coexist because, and this constraint should be kept in mind, insofar as participatory governance often goes along with depoliticization. This is the core of my argument. I will start with this depoliticizing effects of participatory governance, and in so doing, my, part, my, my presentation is to a certain extent the English version of a book chapter that I co-authored with Peter Münte. The book is circulating somewhere namely in the introduction to Mikrostrukturen der Governance, Microstructures of Governance, published 2012 with uh, Nomos, in which we first tried to, to elaborate our critique of, of governance. <coughs> I will, however, present more than this core idea. While the book addresses questions of material analysis and interpretive <coughs> methods, my contribution today will rather follow a different path, asking what practical, you might also say political, consequences could be drawn from the analysis mentioned. So, second point, governance, depoliticization and regulation. Um, the term, term governance in the social sciences as well as in political practice has emerged as a result of a crisis of interventionist thinking. Post-interventionist theories and concepts of pluralist societies had raised questions that uh, the idea of governance promised to answer by replacing more, more rigid concepts of social steering by new ideas of cooperation, negotiation, co-production, hybrid communication, self-regulation, network, etc. Originally, interestingly enough, originally stemming from economy, Coase 1937 and Williamson 1975, where it was mainly used to focus on good governance in organizations, the semantics of governance spread over the political sciences, especially international relations and policy research. And in this tradition, governance is being understood as a form of statehood mainly characterized by negotiation and cooperation in contrast, in contrast to hierarchical structures which were understood as properties of the democratic national state. And, besides speaking, also in, in certain contrast to markets. Um, it is well known that with, with good reason the notion of governance has often been criticized as being fuzzy and blurred, being characterized by a multiplicity of different and often even contradicting definitions. Um, Detlef Sack, for instance, a political scientist, distinguishes at least eight different usages of the term governance oscillating between more practical aspects of social control on the one hand and scientific observation and description on the other. My, my point now is that it is not so often this, this, this often criticized terminological broadness of the semantics of governance that provokes questions again, but rather the specific amalgamation of social theory and political practice connected to governance. This is something very particular we don't, or we, we not own, but we, we find, we typically find uh, when the semantics of governance occur. As I indicated in the beginning, the practical prominence of governance is the result of a far-reaching, well, I call it social scientification of the political. I will try to explain what is, what is meant by this, by this uh, term. And I will unfold this particular sub-argument in, in four steps, as you see there uh, in the second chapter. Governance as a as a semantic construct. In its current use, the term governance, and now I'm, I'm mostly speaking from the perspective of uh, sociology of knowledge, 
In its current use, the term governance can be conceived of as a semantic construct originally created in the, somewhere in the social sciences. It's a, a scientific invention. Its before-mentioned blurkness gains a certain shape by a characteristic mixture with connotations that are understood as typical for, of, uh, for governance. Um, I already mentioned a few of them. Prominent combinations, for instance, cooperation, negotiation, co-production, self-regulation, and many other terms of similar quality. They are usually combined with more classical concepts of social theory and of theory of the state, respectively. Yeah? It's not only cooperation and negotiation, it's these new forms within the framework of a theory of the state. Yeah. And this combination brings forward a narrow link with discourses of participation on the one hand and with neoliberal discourses on the other. The first participation are aimed at an increased sharing of civil society in political decision making, whilst the latter, neoliberal, focus on the drawback of the state. Both, both aspects, both discourses, are neatly combined in governance. Although being so obvious, the close connection of these two discourses has not, has not yet been studied thoroughly. Participatory governance thus results in a concept of the production of the public good that is either based on the involvement of concerned parties, on civic engagement and the dialogue between social interest parties, or on societal self-regulation and individual initiative. On a semantic level, these discourses are closely related with each other in spite of their different structural and political implications. And this is quite a wonder how it works. That these two things are so closely interrelated. Uh, thus, the semantics of governance constitutes a double achievement. It creates an analytical perspective for the social sciences taking new aspects in the center that were rather marginalized in the classical theory of the states, and concurrently, it constitutes a very specific practical perspective, characterized by a positive estimation of these new forms, cooperation, participation, dialogue. Conversely, conversely, the classical elements of sovereignty, such as rule, power, control, sovereign function, and the like, are rather proscribed in the semantics of governance, while on the structural level they continue to exist. Still, of course, there is power. From the perspective of sociology of knowledge, governance therefore appears as a new language of ruling, as Hauss uh, uh, is called. Neue Sprache des Regierens. The discourse of governance, in other words, yields a kind of language in which analytical, normative, and ideological aspects are intricately and inextricably interwoven. Thus, the constitution of social structures can hardly be distinguished any more from their scientific analysis. So it's, it's in, a, in a very interesting way are a field where social scientists and political practitioners cooperate in creating a new type of social reality. Second step, steering. Steering and governance. Why has governance become such an attractive and powerful discourse? As I already mentioned in the beginning, the particular appeal of governance became manifest mainly in a historical period, period when uh, interventionist policies and the idea of societal steering experienced a fundamental crisis. In contrast to these older forms of naive, cybernetic thinking, uh, as if you could uh, steer society like a, a vehicle, um, in contrast to these older forms of naive cybernetic thinking, 
governance gained a strong attractiveness by refocusing three theoretical core elements. Firstly, the focus on the production of the public good somehow vanished. The focus of the production of the public, the emphasis is on the public, the public good somehow vanished in favor of multi-level and multi-actor networks of negotiations between different public and private actors. So, the, the relationship between public goods and private, well, interests, not goods, interests, became somehow oscillating and amalgamated. Secondly, State-centered and linear models of ruling were replaced by rhizomatic interlinkages of recursively coordinated actions. Just as a side note, this very broad definition, and you can find it in literature, every, all, almost everywhere, this very broad definition of governance leads to the consequence that each and every form of coordinated action has to be conceived of as governance, with the reverse implication that there is no empirical realm anymore of non-governance. So one could, one could uh, question the use of such a broad definition that this is overarching and covers everything under the umbrella of governance. Be it as it may, the third conceptual shift pertains to the instruments of ruling. <coughs> Whereas the traditional means consisted of law, command, control, allocation of goods and provision of infrastructure, governance is much more based on hybrid procedures and arrangements as mentioned before. Uh, however, these conceptual reorientations should not conceal the fact that there is also a deep-rooted continuity between steering and governance. What holds these aspects together is the general idea of a profound malleability, shapeability of uh, all social phenomena. <coughs> uh, we can shape, design, uh, uh, social phenomena, governance, in other words, indeed changed the instruments of ruling, but it preserves and even strengthens the idea of controlling and shaping societal conditions. Malleability as the, the premise, the, the presupposition, presupposition of all um, uh, theories of governance. In order to address this very essence of these relations between politics, law, economy, and other social realms, <coughs> I would suggest using the term regulation. I do not claim that the scholarly debate had completely ignored the regulatory nucleus of governance. Michael Zürn, for instance, has addressed this issue as an empirical fact. However, a theoretical perspective is, as far I, as I can see, still missing in this respect. <clears throat> the term regulation has various sources. It has gained a certain prominence in political economy by Hirsch, Jessop, Alieta, Boyer and others. From this particular angle, regulation stands for the task of taming modern forms of capitalism. In so far, it is dealing with a very specific aspect that is mainly situated in the relations between politics and economy firstly, and that is built upon a very particular kind of social theory. In, in contrast to these or complementary to these approaches, I take the position of uh, sociological systems theory that allows for a broad variety of intersystemic relations and that also takes into consideration the fact that modern society is rather polycentric and not so much centered around one single system, be it politics or uh, economy. It's, it's rather uh, an interplay between a, a multiplicity of <coughs> systems. In, uh, in, in so far, I share, obviously, uh, uh, presuppositions made by uh, governance theory. 
Against this background, I understand regulation now as any operation of a social system that aims at deciding, defining, setting the state of another system, of a goal system, with respect to the production of the public good. So a very simple, clear-cut relation between two actors, systems, you call them as you like, uh, with the aim of the influencing, A influ wants to influence B, and with respect to the production of public goods. So in this definition we exclude any kind of, well let's say, individual relation of uh, trying to influence another person, or, uh, uh, just to, to follow your, your personal interests. It has, it has to do something with public goods, in, in my understanding. But this is an, a definition, this is, it's axiomatic, you, you could uh, uh, easily replace it by other definitions. The general, or this general, sorry, this general understanding of regulation can be specially traced back into debates in legal theory and sociology of law of the 1990s. American and British uh, research in those days started to distinguish between governance and regulation. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, in the journal on this issue since, since quite uh, a decade or so. And the debate often conceptualized regulation as a specific form of governance. So governance as a large concept and regulation as a more, more specific aspect. Braceway is, is uh, one of the authors. In the tradition of this debate, regulation expresses a specific part of governance dealing with the steering of events and states of affairs, while governance in addition means um, granting, allocating and distributing. This is their understanding. Re regulation very narrow and fixed to law and control. Um, however, I think in this definition it remains unclear why the latter mechanisms allocating, uh, granting, distributing should not have regulatory qualities. Of course they do, of course they define and shape the state of affairs in uh, social systems. Therefore, I think it seems advisable to understand regulation as the quintessence of all operations that aim at influencing a goal system with respect to public good. And according to this concept, regulation is not restricted to control and intervention in the sense of the old regulative interventionist law. It encompasses limiting and risk minimizing instruments as well as promoting and enabling ones. Julia Black speaks about regulation as facilitation. This is, this is something that is very important uh, when, I, when I talk about regulation. Um, uh, German legal scientists are interested in regulation fostering innovation. Um, Hofmann Riem, a former judge at the Constitutional Court and uh, well, a well-known uh, sociologist of law in Germany, he, he conducted uh, quite a lot of research projects in, in this realm, regulation fostering innovation. Uh, Gunnar Volker Schuppert accentuates the fact that governance, as he says at one, at one uh, uh, instance, governance is largely re regulation. Um, he doesn't draw any consequences from that, but he said governance is largely regulation. Interesting. Okay. As I would, would argue, um, this approach has at least three advantages. Firstly, it allows us to analyze shifts between different forms of regulation, as we observed, for instance, in the transition from steering to governance, and to compare these forms against the common basis, namely the assumption of malleability and regulation. Secondly, it reminds us of the fact that in all forms of governance rests a nucleus of decision-making related to the task of fostering the common good. Thirdly, the concept of regulation reveals the dimension of knowledge much more than theories of governance, which are often focused on institutions and organizations. The aspect of knowledge becomes especially important and fruitful when we look at the relation between law, politics and science. Regulation then appears as a part of an overall process of 
progressive scientification. It becomes relevant as soon as the relation between, between those who govern and those who are governed is understood as calculable and therefore approachable for science. This is, I think this is a move, a historic move that hasn't been understood in its, in its full dimension. That all these ideas about regulation and governance are based on the assumption of calculability, that you can calculate uh, what is going on in society. And this is an aspect of a process of scientification going far back in, in the last two or three centuries. Governing then becomes an issue of scientific expertise rather than of political prudence. There is a big shift. So, what I want to say is, if, if you come from, from this point of view of sociology of knowledge, these things gain, gain interest and, and become more and more important. And uh, this is what I want to hint at when, when I suggest uh, re replacing, replacing the semantics of governments to a certain extent by uh, uh, semantics and concepts of regulation. Step number four in chapter two. Two cultures of regulation. As a result, and this is uh, the, the hypothesis we put forward in, in Peter Mündes in my, in my uh, recent book, two contradictory cultures of regulation have emerged. On the one hand, there are structures safeguarding and guaranteeing freedom. On the other, we are facing the expectation that cit citizens have to cooperate at an increasing rate. And this is nothing less than true. This expectation requires a kind of ethics and individual constitution of subjectivity that is compatible to the cooperative style, a kind of regulatory mentality, in other words, which significantly contrasts with traditional concepts of sovereignty. The interpretive pattern that operates in contemporary forms of regulation very much relies upon a specific pressure to cooperate and to be engaged. It goes hand in hand with specific techniques of self. I will not go into the details of governmentality here. Um, Eutling Lemke and others have, have uh, extensively written on this issue. But I would rather emphasize the fact that the semantics of governance somehow diffuses the ambivalences which characterize regulation in modern society. The, the, the nucleus of regulation is becoming concealed by the semantics of governance, by what one could call the social scientification of uh, regulation. This is what I mean by social scientification. The new forms of governance often occur as sublime mechanisms of depoliticization, forcing participants into cooperation and consent, where also the insistence on legal rights or manifest political interests could be functionally equivalent. Not better, but functionally equivalent. Interestingly enough, the described depoliticization comes in scientific garment, namely as a mixture between analytical and normative assertions in social sciences. As an effect, this social scientification tends to produce two contradictory effects. Besides the traditional guarantee of freedom, usually connected with a strong rule of law, a very far-reaching pressure and demand of cooperation and participation have become powerful, closely guarded under the surface of the brave new world of governance. This is my strong hypothesis. Um, I would now like to come to, to the third uh, chapter, 
and give you some, some examples for what I'm talking about before I speak about the implications of my analysis for the social sciences in general and for sociology of law in particular. I owe you some examples for my propositions, propositions that could be estimated as rather strong hypotheses, as I well know. <clears throat> Since the 1990s, a number of projects have been conducted in my group dealing with various kinds of participatory governance, so I focused on this participation aspect more or less. And these projects mainly focused on decision-making procedures with a particular concern for licensing procedures in the area of new technologies, such as bi biotechnology, for instance. <clears throat> for comparability, all cases were, or most of the cases in these early years, were located in the field of plant biotechnology, green biotechnology. And uh, the aim of our research was to examine the community, communicative construction of governance and participation in a legal context under varying institutional, national and procedural conditions. And uh, the legal context of such licensing procedures is constituted by material law on the one hand, which comprises the legal regulation of genetically modified organisms, aspects as biosafety, precaution and risk regulation, and on the other hand, the licensing procedures also are constituted by procedural provisions regulating the rights of different actors and the modus operandi of the procedure. In this context, the most relevant projects were a study financed by Volkswagen Foundation in the mid-90s and a European-funded project uh, conducted between 2001 and 2007, where we, where we compared uh, uh, this kind of participatory procedures in, in seven countries of the, of the EU. Then, um, finally, a study supported by the German Ministry of Education and Research between 2002 and 2004. These studies, are the, the first wave of our, our research, indicate a tendency of participatory governance to generate serious problems in those cases, and only in those cases where it is embedded in a formal procedure with an elaborated uh, legal framework. The data show that the political communication as part of science governance becomes somewhat marginal under such circumstances. The social field in which communication takes place is not open to all ideas of what constitutes relevance. It is rather pre-structured and loaded with legal rationality before the first utterance is even made. Legal rationality provokes social effects that, from the observing position of a political discourse, are perceived as political. Detailed analysis could demonstrate further that communication runs into fundamental political conflict exactly when this legal predominance obtains. One could say that the political discourse illuminates the blind spot of legal discourse, namely the non-legal power-based and political sources of legal distinctions. The law is necessarily immune to this aspect because it cannot address questions of pre-legal or extra-legal power. Communication analysis shows that such, such questions often lead into paradoxical situations. Communications where such blind spots are, are addressed between different discourses regularly result in a very fundamental, very hard, non-trivial conflict, a conflict based on the mutual inability to continue communication. Uh, different, different in Utah's sense. And under this condition one observes numerous forms of structural and tenance operations where the discourse of law protects its basic distinctions against the paradoxical consequences uh, coming in from the political discourse. The dynamics observed in our data are empirical examples of such structural maintenance via the exclusion of political discourse. With respect to participatory licensing procedures, one can clearly state that the intended democratization of science governance, in fact, fosters the depoliticization of the communication. Example number one. 
Second example. What could be observed within a legal context also holds true under more political auspices, although in, in inverse relation. In a study on consensus conferences as a form of participatory science governance, Alexander Gerstorf shows how participants are forced to follow a procedural program that has been established by social scientists, facilitators and communication experts and that turns interested and possibly engaged citizens into role players exec executing, executing the instructions of a social scientist scenario. If and in so far as they succeed to maintain their personal autonomy, their subjectivity in this situation, they do so only because they subvert, they subvert the procedural program of this consensus conference. At the end, as Gerstorf shows, the participants establish a specific kind of convivial conversation in which the face-to-face -face interaction of an accidental community creates the atmosphere of friendly indifference that endows the circle with the feeling of mutual interest and personal understanding, but does not, not at all, contribute to the decision-making process. Citizens react to the, to the subtle power of these communication experts by establishing community, face-to-face -face interaction, conversation. The procedure, and I do think it is representative for consensus conferences in science and technology governance in general, depoliticizes a political conflict and dissolves it in conversational communication and communitization. Moreover, it also tends to become a kind of delegalization or even disenfranchisement, namely insofar as legitimate legal positions in a conflict become invisible. They vanish in the smooth and, and nice atmosphere of face to face conversation. Same example. Peter Münte, to give a last, a third example, has studied a mediation process with respect to the expansion of the Vienna airport. Um, here again, he observes effects of political and legal expropriation by means of participatory governance. The, his article is in the, in the, uh, in the book on microstructures of government. Participation in the staging of the legitimacy successfully supersedes the consideration of interests, as Münter argues. Summarizing this point, uh, one can say that these few examples show the, the necessity of a precise analytical focus on the function of the various forms of governance. If one takes a closer look at these functions, one will almost inevitably come across regulation as the nucleus of all operations linked with governments. And against this theoretical and empirical background, I suggest the recollection of the functional nucleus of governance with the term regulation and with particular emphasis on the delegalizing and depoliticizing effects of certain forms of participatory governance. The intention of my proposal is neither to dismiss the perspective of governance in total, nor to revert to interventionist concepts. This would be completely misunderstood. But rather to set the stage for a dispassionate and detached analysis of law and politics. To some extent, the scholarly debate has not yet given sufficient answers to the many questions of aims, purposes, and adequate means of governance. It rather blurs the view on the central task of influencing societal dynamics due to its 
certainly justified, but to some extent exaggerated interest in procedural reflexive networking and multi-level kind of activities and institutions. To be sure, recent discourse on governance seemed to be seen the regulatory basics that had formally uh, initiated the reflection about societal steering. The term regulation, as I presume, can revisit this original intention in a theoretically more stringent way uh, without throwing the fruitful results produced by the governance debate overboard. Okay. Um, coming to some concluding considerations in, in the fourth part, I would like to ask what the practical implications of such a theoretical position might be. And uh, this is a very tentative move and uh, of course work in progress as you will easily see. Currently I would identify at least five aspects where these practical implications uh, can be found. And I would just list them and the list is not complete of course. Uh, and it's open to debate. First, sociological analysis can improve policy advice regarding participatory decision making. Against a widespread and unreflected opinion, we can show that more participation will not necessarily result in political empowerment and improvement of decisions. And this is to a, to a large extent contraintuitive, it's not sexy, it sounds conservative, and you will get problems when you argue in that direction, but I think it's, yeah, you, you, you can't miss this point. It will not necessarily result in, in an improvement of the situation. One would rather recommend carefully taking into consideration the functional differentiation of society, resulting in a far-reaching differentiation of purposes, forms and arenas of participation. Since quite a long time, the fact has been criticized that participatory governance usually does not answer the question who is linked to the how, no, sorry, no, no, how it is linked to the institutions of democratic politics. How it is linked to the institutions of democratic politics. You have hundreds and hundreds of participatory exercises without any impact. Just, just for the sake of itself and for, uh, for the social scientists <laughs> for producing it. And uh, uh, the, the, one of the core issues is how are these exercises linked to the institutional, institutional level of democratic politics and um, of, of uh, the state and the law. Such linkages would have to be designed within the framework of a democratic legitimation. And from this angle, first of all, the question of the specific function of a particular participatory arrangement at stake has to be answered. What is the political or legal problem? And why it is, it, is it impossible to solve it with the, uh, established instruments? Where is the need for additional instruments? Yeah. This question is always be treated as, as always said. Only against this background the need for a specific mode of regulation can be argued for properly and policy advice will gain quality and power and will get rid of the taste of partisan, partisan science. Second, sociological analysis allows for a better understanding of undesirable development. In our research on participatory governance in legal and administrative decision making, we found, as, as I told you, that the legal framework builds an iron cage of the law, fencing political discourses and excluding them from the decision making process on a certain level. Such exclusive dynamics can be viewed as an expression of a specific culture of regulation, namely techno-scientific normativity, the collusive cooperation between law and techno-sciences, as I tried to argue in the article. Practical suggestions against this background go in the direction of procedural differentiation. By this term I mean the separation of functions in, in different parts of decision-making processes. 
legal norm application is not the appropriate setting for political participation. And this is a very basic insight that every uh, student of law should learn in, in his or her first semester. But in our political culture, we have, we seemingly have forgotten this. No application is not, not the place for debating about, about agenda setting, norm setting. You will get conflicts if you do so. However, this argument does by no means result in a complete abstinence from political evidence in case related procedures. There are alternative procedural forms, such as certain types of local meetings with political character or scenario workshops applied very early in the decision-making process and clearly connected to the latter, institutionally embedding this, this uh, essential issue. Such procedures, procedural forms could be thought of as alternatives to the iron cage on the one side and to more of the same logics on the other side. Third, a more detached and dispassionate analysis allows us to identify depoliticization in the exercise of governance, but also to suggest repoliticization, the latter meaning recollection of questions of power connected to the nucleus of governance, namely regulation. This political term, as I would call it, also fosters the recollection of questions of responsibility. A very, very difficult issue in a world that seemingly dissolves the attribution of responsibility, from personal addresses to organizations, to networks, and even to machines. Think, for instance, of stock exchange electronic trading systems and similar things. Where is the responsibility for the financial crisis? If only the machines draw the if, if, and then so far. Where is responsibility? So this is what I mean by repoliticization. We should try to find the social addresses. And uh, if the machines are the addresses, we, we should reflect on the consequences. Okay, this was very good. A similar dissolution of responsibility can be seen in various forms of governance, where the burden and the risk of decision-making vanish in diffuse multiplicity of levels, actors, and fading responsibilities. Multiplying the number of decision-makers minimizes the individual responsibility. In our research projects, we clearly saw this effect. Taking part in a participatory governance often meant the sharing of responsibility and risk for a decision emerging from an opaque and hyper-complex process without clear attribution of political will to such processes. And this is, of course, a very, very important mechanism for the political system. Well, number four. The recollection of regulation thereby reminds us of the distribution of political power. We focus on ruling as the relation between social positions equipped with different capabilities and potentials of power. The term regulation bears this meaning and thus reminds of us of the central aspect. Inequality. Fifth. On the other hand, and perhaps the most relevant issue for sociologists of law, the idea of regulation brings us not only to the political nucleus, but also to the legal basis of ruling. Too often, the discourse on governance seems to disregard the central role of legal rights in the process of regulation. It is nothing less than trivial to claim that the formal, the cold, more than formal rationality of the law guarantees freedom and subjective rights in general. And in regulation, legal rules have their defined place and regulatory means and ends have to be cross-checked against legal provisions. A very classical and trivial In governance, this relation is much less clear. 
In so far, regulation very distinctly opens the view upon both sides of the law, the iron cage I was talking about, as well as the enabling, ensuring, and liberating guarantees provided for by the law. Constitutional regimes, as Gunter Teutner has suggested uh, recently, may perhaps fulfill similar functions, but this would be another presentation, and uh, I, I think I have spent all my time, I have to come to an end, and would say in summary, therefore it can be said that sociological theory can gain enormous practical relevance if it only keeps distance and focuses on detached observation. Associating science in a short circuit with the presumed good party in politics will always bear the danger of borrowing exactly those interpretive patterns from the practice that have just caused the problems at stake. Thank you very much.